Oh, we are live. How about that? I am Thursday. And I'm Varmint. Way over there in the ether, existing somewhere just beyond sight and sound. Just to, you know, really, I guess, kick things off, I want to go ahead and just launch into a, a thought that's been bouncing around in my head recently, because I keep encountering it. I keep reading about it, and it's about the show Luke Cage, and if you haven't seen the show and care about spoilers, I'm going to spoil the hell out of it probably during this conversation, so just a, a warning for you. Spoilers ahead for Luke Cage. I thought the show was great, I had fun watching it, but all that aside, I keep seeing this complaint from a certain segment of, especially, you know, the white population, to call it out where it is, where they... Oh, the show is racist. There's not enough white people in the show. They keep showing black people. They keep showing Mexicans. Where's the white people? And, oh, well, there was a white person, but he was a villain. And this feels racist, and we feel excluded. And my first thought was, so now you get it, I'm sure, finally. That, hey, you know, when you're not represented in that media in a favorable light or at all, you don't feel included in it. You, you feel I don't know, excluded, alienated maybe a little bit, because where are you in that? And you see this, I, I've read articles from foreign people who, you know, are in, big into American television and movies, who are elated whenever their country is even mentioned as existing in the movie. Doesn't matter what light it's shown in, America is admitting that there's something outside of America. Hey, we got mentioned. It, it's kind of like that, and that's pretty fucking sad, actually. Our media is so focused on one particular segment of our population, generally, that deviating from that becomes, well, problematic. It becomes controversial. Like, just Luke Cage being Luke Cage in the show has been controversial, If you, especially if you look at various more racist-leaning groups and their view of this show as basically being an open propagation of, oh, a black superhero, right? Who's bulletproof, that, who wears a hoodie. This is obviously, you know, glorifying X, Y, and Z. And obviously, that's not what they're trying to do. Quite obviously. But yet you're still getting that. You're still getting the points where people are saying it's racist for not showing white people. I mean, not just let's pretend that it's not set in Harlem, you know, with a predominantly black population by reality, but no, we're, we're going to pretend that that's not relevant, and we're going to ignore the fact that usually media doesn't show minorities, women, black people, also, you know, all these different groups and positions of power and control and being, look at Cottonmouth as a villain. For those who, you know, don't know, uh, might not be familiar, he's the first real villain of our show. He's sort of a criminal element figure, uh, but at the same time, he's a very relatable character. He's a bad person. They established this very early that he is not a good person at all. He, he does terrible things. and They're just true to Marvel form in this, where uh, just like in Jessica Jones, when it comes to their villains, they make them relatable. Exactly. Where this is a powerful black figure who is intimidating, who stands before you in this great scene with basically a crown atop his head, letting both his captive and you, the audience, know that you're looking at the person in charge of shit right now, and he controls things and shut the fuck up now. <laughs> and it's sort of intimidating, but at the same time, it's like it's a good thing, I think, to see. Yeah, he's a criminal and everything, but he is a powerful, relatable figure. There's a human being in there. You can understand the choices he made and the forces outside of him that led him to that path. And him being a black person is just there. It's a part of his character. It informs a lot of him, but at the same time, it's not an excuse for anything. It's not pointed to as a reason for what he's doing. It's just a piece of his character. His upbringing was shitty. This is Harlem. It's important for it to be popular in the media for people who are in groups that are normally other to just be normalized. Exactly. In both good and bad lights, because everybody has all of these qualities. Every group should be treated as human beings, which is that they can be good and evil. They can be fallible yet noble and all of that shit, right? We're all complicated creatures, and the more we embrace that, the less, well the less we embrace stereotypes, because stereotypes simplify people into easy-to-understand, digestible, and usually incorrect little snippets. 
making characters complex makes them relatable and real. Even that, you know, Cottonmouth is a villain, a bad person, a criminal, making him relatable and understandable, and even someone you can sympathize with and feel for, makes it so that, in general, you look at those people maybe slightly differently. Maybe you could come away from that saying, you know, yeah, he's a criminal, but he's an understandable person. I don't like him, but I get it. I understand. And that that's the beginning of empathy, isn't it? For people that you normally don't like, that point where you say, yeah, I don't like what you're doing. I don't like who you are, whatever, but <sighs> I get it. Well, see, that's why I really liked when I was watching Jessica Jones the other day. That's the other show. The absolute double think of Kilgrave's character. Oh, he is the perfect example. The Thank you, you for segueing into you him. Empathet, you empathize so completely with his character based on who he is, but at the same time understand that he is a monster. He is a fully human monster as a villain. But see, the way they had him in the show, his background there where he was basically given this power from a very young age... For people who don't know, yeah, he uh, has mind control. He basically has a form of mind control where whatever he says becomes basically God's word to you. If he says don't move, you will physically rip your nails out trying to hang on to that spot. <laughs> His word is basically your life. So, frightening level of power given to a child. And you can only imagine the effect that would have, the very yeah. predictable effect that almost necessarily has on a human from birth. And he is a horrible, horrible, remorseless, terrible, rapist, monster, piece of shit person who does deserve every bad thing that happens. But at the same time, you can't, I think, help but understand why he became that. Because when everything you say becomes the divine truth to whomever hears it, that's normal. That, that becomes normal. Just telling people to jump off a cliff and watching them do it might sicken you and disgust you at first. But the tenth time you get mad at somebody and say, oh, go fuck off. And they somehow interpret that in some way that is both creative and destructive. Well, eventually you become numb to it. Oh, hi. Hi. Nice to see people showing up. Um, actually, uh, true to seminal form of any like show that just is just starting, we are going to be fucking things up. We need to introduce what the show even is, <laughs> which is um, this is uh, since your Thursday. Yes. Uh, what we came up with, at least to start off the top of our heads, is just this is Thursdays. Thursdays, Thursdays, Thursdays. Because it's on Thursday. <laughs> Um, this is just general rambling stuff. We want to talk about nerdy, political whatnots, and I'm just here as the peanut gallery to kind of keep the conversation rolling. Well, you're sort of the conversational assistant, the whip. Keep it going, right? So yeah, I'm just I'm just loving the Marvel shows like Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, especially for their political commentary, precisely because it's important for those political messages to become normalized in the media. Well, let's talk about Jessica Jones specifically for a moment, right? Uh -huh. Just for one, you know, Kilgrave. Beyond the concept of being, you can relate to a monster, you know, because anybody can become horribly evil, basically, with the wrong circumstances pushing them too far. You know, and godlike powers with a childish mind will be bad. But beyond that, he sort of, I love the fact that he functions functions as a perfect example of like every abusive relationship of every abuser who feels justified in their abuse because of their own twisted sense of love i'm hurting you because i love you that's sort of kilgrave's catchphrase in a sense but he I thinks mean, that his love justifies everything that he is doing that his he loves her so the fact that he has to hurt her and torment her just to make her understand is for her own good it's for her own good that he's hurting her. If she would just understand what he's trying to say, if she would just listen, then they sound like every abusive partner. I don't want to hurt you. You're just making me hurt you. If you didn't make me angry, I wouldn't hurt you. If you just did it right, I wouldn't have to hurt you. There's always a condition, a reason. And what is Kilgrave? I just want you to love me. That's all. But even if it costs you your sanity, your dignity, and your free will, 
Just, it's just, I love me, right? That's all I'm asking. It's what <clears throat> happens in every conversation I have with a person who is especially privileged, who isn't knowledgeable about social issues, where they take every opportunity to excuse and dismiss things that they don't have experience with. And to address the question we have here, does he love her or is he just obsessed? He's just obsessed. Yes. Because that was the thing, actually, Theremin Trees just released a, a video about called Degrading Love, Part 1, and yeah. it starts out talking about this, the way there's so many different contexts in which the word love can be used. It's uh, domestic abuser's justification. Actually, queuing into that, you know, point here made by Ivy, that I think it's more than that. I don't think he knew what real love was when he was raised as an experiment, so he was showing, quote-unquote, love how his parents did to him. We were sort of talking about he is product of his upbringing, to a point, that not only was he treated like an experiment that his parents, to save his life, mind you, did, you know, experiment upon him and by the whatever way, else. By the way, the road to hell? Paved with good intentions. He's a pretty serious character in that way, where he is head-on, that sort of callous abusiveness that disguises itself as love, that obsessive possessiveness that pretends to be love. It's not love, obviously it's not love, but well, it's, to those people it is. That's the kind of love they know. He, that's the only kind of love I think a person like Kilgrave with that kind of power growing up that way could know is the love through control. Because you could never know honest love. How could you? Your every word is someone's will now. Well, it's so, the same way that people say they're nice but actually aren't type idea. Right. It's that, you know, your actions speak louder than your words. Exactly. But the people who say they're nice believe that they're nice, even though they're not really, and they're actually motivated by selfish desires. They think they're nice. They're believing they're nice. Just like... He thinks he's being loving. He thinks he's just trying to show her the right way, just... Make her understand. That's what he keeps saying. I'd just make her understand. If I could just make her feel what I feel. <laughs> God, that neck snap was satisfying at the end. Oh but, my God, wasn't it? But that show was just... It's important not just for Kilgrave's representation of that sort of possessiveness, that sort of abusiveness, that power play that a lot of relationships get fucked up by that need to control, just over-exemplified by mind control powers. You don't even need mind control powers to dominate and hurt and control people, but it's a good no, but, metaphor. But that's, that's the thing that's shown through that, is that how these things are subtle. Yes. That's one thing that actually is also exemplified by it, is the importance of language and things like that. Yes. How it's, again, it's in the way you couch things. It's what you actually mean with what you say yes. and things like that. And like, also... Impact versus intent. Yes. He's a big point in that, isn't he? Impact versus intent. I never meant to kill someone when I told them to screw off. But you did. It's sort of like... I didn't kill her. How many times does he say that? I know. When, yeah, they killed themselves, but not really. It's like, can you argue that you committed suicide if you hold a gun to someone's head and order them to eat poison. Is that really suicide? No. <laughs> That's just murder. But it's that disconnect he's allowed to have with his powers. I didn't do the deed. It's that sort of thing where people hire hitmen and feel no guilt because I didn't kill anyone. I didn't do that. No, no. She Never mind the fact that they would be alive if not for you. Yes, but there's the disconnect, the space between the event that you cause to happen and yourself. That in-between is enough for a lot of people to say, I didn't do it. Wearing I didn't pull that trigger. Wearing a pair of sunglasses is enough for people to imagine you don't exist. Yes. Because you can't see my eyes. Exactly. It's a very useful strategy, actually, if you're nervous or something in an interview or something, you know. As long as it's not indoors or whatever. <laughs> um, but in situations where you can wear shades or glasses even, they don't have to be shades. Anything that actually goes in front of your eyes can increase your confidence. Just a psychological effect. But 
<laughs> the U.S. is living in a comic book reality right now. The orange skull Trump has taken over the country, and there's no Steve Rogers Captain America to stop him. That's why each of us need to plant ourselves like a tree by the river of truth and tell the whole country, no, no you, you move. move. I actually just did a video about that, didn't I? Yeah. Passive and active resistance. That's what we need in response to Trump. Yes. Say no to the discrimination. It, it's pretty simple, but it's bold. Always forward. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing <laughs> it back, right? That was a great message from that show. Luke from Cage. Luke Cage? Yeah. That point of always forward. What's happened has happened. You now have to deal with it. What are you doing now, moving forward? Can't change the past. That's why it was a good tweet to put out in response to the election. Yes. That all you can do is move forward. It's that point where Luke Cage did it well, where you had that moment of solidarity where people were standing up for Luke Cage. I don't think I told you about this, but we're, again, like I said, there's lots of spoilers for stuff in here. They're looking for Luke Cage by the description of a bullet hole hoodie, right? He has a hoodie with bullet holes in it. So all the different people around that area start all wearing hoodies with bullet holes in it. All walking around out there. And they're walking around like when the cops start and stop, they pull out the hoodie showing, you know, it's not them. It's not Luke Cage. <laughs> and so the cops basically keep trying to pull people over and all these people are wearing the hoodies, bullet holes in it. Mm -hmm. And so they're all covering for him. Yeah. And that's that sort of point there, that poignant sort of solidarity that's passive in its way. You don't have to stand up to the people doing the bad things directly. You can stand with the people that are victims. That was sort of one of those points I think they were trying to make in that show, is that there are the Luke Cages, the people who have the power to stand up, mm -hmm. and then there are the other people who have the power to stand with him. They don't have the super strength. They can't fight the bad guy. They can't take on a diamond back or whatever. But what they can do is stand with the people who are fighting. See Their again, solidarity. See, again, Naruto was such a good show. <sighs> <laughs> you know. Made much more ham-fistedly there. But no, yeah, the fact that... That message your, was great. Your individual actions, especially as a leader, are backed up by however many multitudes. Yes. Well, it also, that it just takes one to start something. Just one person needs to say no. Break because, the bystander effect. Exactly. A lot of people disagree with bad things. This is just well known. A lot of people watching somebody being harassed... Don't agree with it, but they're scared, they're disaffected, they, they're confused, they don't know what to do or whatever, and they all stand back and do nothing. All it generally takes is one person to step up and say, stop it, this is wrong, to have other people stand up with them. It's not that they're cowards, at least not usually, some of them may be, but it's usually that we're not generally trained in society to stand up for ourselves. It's not a skill that generally gets cultivated too well. And not just to stand up for ourselves, but to stand up for other people. To stand up against something that seems scary and insurmountable. You're not even taught to stand up to authority. Oh, of course we're not taught to stand up to we're authority. We're nation. Yeah. The last thing we want, we being the society at large, is for people to stand up to authority because, well, that's not useful. That doesn't help the machine progress. So, what that means is that standing up to authority is the most effective method of fucking it up. Because it's the one thing above all else they don't want you to do. Stay in line, stay in school, stay, keep your head down. Don't break the law, don't, you know, just. Don't have the reasonable response to. When one of your top uh, top supporters, what did he say? That, ah, yes. Yeah. One of his top supporters, Carl Higby, I think that name is, a uh, former spokesman for the Great American PAC, who is an independent fundraising committee, made work, who does, by the way, a bunch of work for the uh, Trump administration's uh, fundraising efforts before they were elected. Um, he basically made an appeal 
to the precedent set by the internment of the Japanese Americans during World War II as part of the beginnings of the registration of Muslims. Let me get to a little further point on that in a moment here, but to start it basically uh, in an interview here, right, on Fox of all places, the Kelly file, <laughs> uh, when you outrage a Fox News reporter, you've done, you, whoa. Speaking about internment and, you know, registration, he said, and I quote, we've done it based on race, we've done it based on religion, we've done it based on region, we've done it with Iraq back a while ago, we did it during World War II with Japanese. And the host's response, right? You're not proposing that we go back to the days of internment camps, I hope. And he said no, but then followed with, we need to protect America first. And that almost sounds like, you know, no, but yes. <laughs> like... Really? That that sounds like I, I basically am obligated to say no because of what that question means. But at the same time, I'm not really wanting to say no. Again, people ignore the substance of what other people say in favor of the words they literally use. Now, to segue into why his, this, you know, supporter, okay, he's just a supporter, right? Maybe he doesn't, you know, he's just talking by himself, right? Could be, except not at all, because, you know... We have an interview, uh, what was it, Thursday? Last Thursday, yes. Um, where ba he was asked about whether Muslims in the country would be forced to register. And his quote was said, they have to be. And he was asked then about, you know, how this would be executed. Would mosques be used as places where people could register? He said, I quote again, different places. You sign up at different places, but it's all about management. Our country has no management. And really, now, let me... Just be real fucking serious here for a second. When you describe the registration of entire groups of people as a management issue, you are fucked in the head. Just gonna stand out on that one. I feel comfortable with that declaration. Mm -hmm. That is not a management problem. That is the beginning of something sickening. You know, I've seen the posts from people, the surviving Jews of World War II, showing off their registration stamps, their tattoos. Mm -hmm. Is that really what we want to be fucking doing again? Like, do we need a repeat of that in history? What were the four things you said it was necessary to destroy a people? Oh, shit. Um, first, you remove them from sight, the getification. Second, you remove their ability to be heard. You strip them of the media. You strip them of coverage. You strip them of visibility. Representation. Representation. Then you strip them of wealth and power in order to remove their ability to affect the change on their own situation. Mm -hmm. And then you remove their rights, their freedoms. You remove their ability to freely move. Then you can destroy them at leisure. Once you have isolated them, Remove their power, remove their freedom, removed their ability to control their own destiny. They have nothing left. And look at what's happened to Native Americans. Case in point. Standing Rock. Look at, well, all of history, actually. Look at all of fucking history. Yeah, That's sort of the point, is that repeatedly, throughout history, any totalitarian regime that has risen on the hatred of a certain group of people has always ended the same way. I mean, but, but it's history 101. Nazis weren't the first ones to do this, nor were they the last ones to do this. This ideology is old, tested, tried, and true. It works because people support it in both willingness and in ignorance. It works because people don't see the threat it poses until it is far too late, usually. It's that old saying about, you know, first they came for blah, and I did not speak up for them because I wasn't one of them, and on and on until they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. It's that point where... Unless you are one of the privileged elites, and that's really actually a hard category to know what's going to end up being when the dust settles, you might think yourself part of the privileged elite. You might think yourself in that group. Oh, well, you know, I'm not one of those people, so obviously I'm okay, but that can inch up pretty easily. Slowly but surely, you know, okay, so we're discriminating against the black people. What's to stop, you know, we used to have some hate for the Irish. We could bring that back, right? You know, we can move this goalpost as much as we want. <laughs> Basically, if you don't pay attention, you start out thinking, oh, this is just going to make it so that I'm going to get 
2% difference on my tax bracket, and that's about all it'll do to affect me. And then you end up in an internment camp, apparently. Well... Over an arbitrary reason that you didn't even consider as a problem, because you weren't paying attention, because complacency. Complacency is one of those things that's so insidious because it's so easy. It's so easy to watch, and inaction is a choice, but it doesn't feel like one. It's like all the people that say, I didn't vote. This isn't my responsibility. No, you, you're, inaction you have a, you is a, have choice. a responsibility for it's like, that choice that you made of inaction. If you look at, like, uh, people talk about yin and yang, right? But there's also neutrality, that inaction and doing nothing is itself a force. That, you know, they even talk about it in Avatar The Last Airbender, the neutral jing, doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Inaction is itself a choice of action. It is a thing that has effects. It is not like by doing nothing, nothing happens. Things happen whether you do things or not. It is an acknowledgement that the rest of the universe cares not about your input unless you have it. If you put no input in, you still get results. The universe has energy outside of your energy. Meaning, if you put nothing into it, it will still create results just without your input. But the chat's having a discussion about voter suppression right now. Mm -hmm. Which is a pretty good point. Voter suppression is uh Well we just had the what was with the Voting Rights Act recently. Yeah, was that vegan. was pulled. Um gerrymandering, the longest standing form of voter suppression and control in our nation pretty much. Um where whole districts are redesigned in order to control the numbers and who votes where in order to control the seats in particular places and the larger demographic numbers and reshape them. It's basically a manipulation, a chicanery, a sleight of hand over the entire population and its core representation. By redrawing districts and certain particular fucking arcane alignments, you can create illusions of majorities and minorities in certain places. CGP Grey has made several great videos about this. Oh, yeah. This. Check it out if you want to actually learn more about the topic. But By the way, links below uh, after the show for pretty much all this stuff. Oh, yeah. But I think one of the biggest problems we have is that, just to go out on a limb here, is that we have a lot of these things happening, like voter suppression and everything, and not enough establishment protest against it. We can see how exactly, I think, useful the uh, Democratic Convention has been for, you know, the cause of the liberal people, which is to say, you know, like having two left shoes useful. Well, we can see how useful it is to do things like safety pin stuffs instead of well, live in a certain way. It's one of those things where, to go momentarily nerdy here... Right? You? Never. <sighs> Never. Um, it's sort of the point of Persona 4, that we would rather live in an illusory world that we create than embrace reality as it actually is. That we'd rather, a lot of us, would rather, you know, change our Facebook profile pic with a filter or put a safety pin on and walk about our day and think we've done something. You know, made a, I made an angry post on Facebook, that'll teach them. Like and we're done with our activism. That's that's okay. I did my I did my piece. The world's better, right? I'm still a bystander in every situation where it matters. But I I, I contributed, so I, I feel better. I, my guilt is absolved. I threw my money at yep. the problem. And so, and everybody, I think, to a point, is guilty of it. I know I am. Like I'm busy, and I mean every single I can make one excuses of all, all day. I can guarantee you that almost every single person who listens to this has not purposely looked up the practices that they find unconscionable by shoe companies in order to be sure that they're buying from ones that don't engage in those practices. We all know that it's a thing, but we don't look it up. Yep. And yet we're responsible for it when we spend our money, but we don't think about that. Because we like to eschew all responsibility in that way. Because we live in the fog. Yep. But yes, as pointed out here, uh, it's not just gerrymandering. Broken scanners, fewing po fewer polling centers causing long lines, strict voter ID laws, you know, illegal requests for identifications, all that stuff. Oh yeah, all that shit. The, like the stories you heard about uh, old Latino women who were turned away saying that 
oh, this is a state dr uh, driver's license and this is a federal election. Yep. See, that's where there were provisions put in place like, you know, a provisional ballot where if your ability to vote is called into question, you can still in many places cast like a provisional ballot, which is I'm voting under the condition that I can later prove my identity or whatever. Basically, my vote has been counted provisional to the fact that I can later demonstrate what is needed. And But people don't talk about that. We don't really educate people on their actual rights to vote. We don't n tell them about what it means. And hell, here's like, for my own example, there were things on the ballot that I didn't even know were going to be there. Like, and I'm, per I'm well read and educated on this stuff, but like, even I was reading stuff like, wait, this is on the, what is this even saying? The obtuse language of the legality of these things where do, you know, do you vote here in to allow under the blah, 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 blah. And, and basically it's just asking, do you want to give more money to something? And they turn it into a fucking paragraph of, you know, under the preponderance of this, seeing that this is true, that, you know, it's like, no, with Please. all of these things that, you know, has been mentioned here, especially closing down the polling centers has been a huge issue that has come up repeatedly where, oh, for cost effectiveness, we're closing, you know, the polling centers and the places where people are going to vote liberal, coincidentally, because, you know, hmm? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Basically. And, you know, the confusing instructions part, I had to deal with when I went to vote, even. They're sitting there, you know, because we had a paper ballot suddenly. When we didn't last time. Then you had to insert it in the scanner, right? And, you know, it's pretty easy overall, but the people there were <laughs> quite less than helpful. And... I had to go to three different locations just to be able to get an opportunity to vote. And I still had to change my address <clears throat> with them because no good reason. It's like, I'm lucky that, you know, I basically have been registered to the same place and I always go vote there, which makes things pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of other people had to deal with bullshit, you know, and <laughs> as noted, it, I don't know if it was all against them, you know, the pro Hillary voters, but it was almost all. From what I've heard and read, like, I know there was like one or two instances of people like in individual places trying to, you know, oust tr Trump voters or whatever. But that was very limited and isolated and certainly not a like organized thing, which is what it seemed to be on the other side. We have an obsolete, arcane fucking election system anyway. Well, yes. When we can have, you know, the world will go to shit. <laughs> Well, not necessarily. Um, I'm ever the optimist, or at least I try to be. This can be a good thing. I mean, besides all the bad things that will come of it, yes. I'm not going to pretend that it's just going to be magically good. Well, but it can be made into a good thing. All the rest of the tabs we have open. Again, it's about people need to actually do something Yes. when these <laughs> issues come up. It is fun to think about, like, aliens or an outsider perspective. Like, look at us like we're like an ant farm and observe us from, like, an impartial outside view for a moment and think, what are these silly little things doing? <laughs> like, look at them scurrying about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so you're the bug out of Men in Black. But it's not like I think we're pests. Oh, I just think we're... A virus. No, no. That was also a stupid line. <laughs> like a virus. <laughs> Except viruses don't build cities, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, right now it's not a great show if you look at it from the outside perspective. It's like, man, these little fleshbags could do a lot better than this. Well, when you elect Donald motherfucking Trump. Well, you know, it's like there's this nice article, uh, Crack put pretty succinctly. Right. Where they talk about how Trump's rise perfectly mirrors Hitler's rise. And, you know, people have gotten already sick of that analogy. I know Hitler and Trump, but it's not so much that I think he's literally going to be a Hitler. It's the point that it's not about 
the Hitler's a stand-in for his rise mirrors the rise of totalitarian regimes in general. His rise mirrors the rise of an autocrat, of somebody who, through demagoguery, attains power beyond what they deserve because of some threat that is ambiguous and all-consuming. It's like being afraid of the dark. There's nothing actually in it, but because you're allowed to imagine it being dangerous, well, the dark could hide anything. Unless you know what's inside of it, well, for all you know, there's like five murderers right over there in that dark alley. Can't see. Almost just like how in this country everybody is more and more afraid of crime, and yet crime rates continue to drop. Right, but you would never know that if you watch the news. That's oh. the thing. Oh, right. Yeah, because the news doesn't sell. That's the thing. Fear sells. It's, it's a well-known truth that fear sells things. It grabs attention. Well, fear can sell things. Sometimes it's not an effective strategy, but it grabs attention, makes somebody afraid. You know what happens? Their higher, more judgmental mind, the more logical part of it, gets more overridden by the emotional base or aspects. It's one of the biggest problems with fear, is that it overrides a lot of logical thinking. I was thinking about how it plays into anger. Anger is one of the things Fear that... Fear leads uh, to anger. anger well, <laughs> leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering, right? <laughs> well, I was thinking of how... Um, it. I think that uh, when it comes to our Facebook uh, shares and things like that, what it, uh, we tend to find is that the things that piss us off are the things that we share the most. Oh, well, yeah. And that the two are kind of just closely related. Well, it's the thing about, like... Let's talk about, to make an analogy with Yelp reviews, right? Well, yeah, and our negativity bias. Exactly. Where if we're satisfied with something, we're far less likely to speak out than if we're unsatisfied. Mm -hmm. The satisfied customer is not as likely to, you know, shout off the rooftops that he would, that I had great service here, you know. Mm -hmm. But the dissatisfied customer... <laughs> is much more likely to get active because they're angry. Anger is a useful emotion sometimes because it prompts action. It can also be a terrible emotion because it prompts action. But... <laughs> but no, you see, that's the thing. That's why I keep telling people they need to be more pissed off to have an appreciation of the severity of the situation because Trump has been elected. Yes. That's the point of all this when we make these comparisons, when we talk about these things, because... People have an appreciation emotionally for the impact of someone like a Hitler. Because it's like, even if, you know, you want to, like, ignore Trump for a moment as basically being a buffoon who really signed up for something that he expected to get a good, like, you know, lark out of and some attention and happened to lend the fucking thing instead. What he represents and the people he It's really the people with. around him. Look at Mike Pence, you know. And, you know, people have tried to dismiss him. Oh, he's just the VP. But... If you look at what Pence has been saying and Trump has been saying, you can see that Trump is kind of interested in letting Pence do a lot of the work. At least that's what it sounds like right now. And based on Trump's history and his general demonstrated inability to stay connected to any particular project for long, I won't be surprised if his cabinet and the people under him do a lot of the heavy lifting in his administration, which is going to be fucking terrifying by the way. Um, because Pence, if you didn't know, is a believer in conversion therapy, is a believer in, you know, basically think of something bigoted towards anything not, you know, cis-normative. And he's that. And him being the vice president is sort of like a slap in the face to basically everybody who is not on that incredibly cis-normative spectrum. You know, being told that you need to be cured is not endearing. Just, just you know, going to say, I, it's, telling somebody with tuberculosis they need to be cured makes sense. Telling somebody who's gay they need to be cured makes you an asshole. <laughs> just say, one of these things is killing you. The other is just who you are. <laughs> Do you need to be cured of blonde hair? Do you need to be, like, cured? Like, what? That's like saying you need to be cured of having two feet. Chop. Yeah, it makes no sense. But yet, this is the kind of person... Let's talk about Steve Bannon, by the way. <laughs> let's drop the bombshell now, right? Who is a racist fuck. If you doubt me, I mean, just one Google search, please. Well, and, and Yeah, yeah, that's a whole mess that I don't even feel like diving into right now. It's just 
go swim in that cesspool if you would like and learn about, you know, was it bear bait? Bear, how do you say that thing? Things Breitbart. Like, Breitbart, that's it. I always could fuck that one up. Breitbart, that's it. Bear bait. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, just the fact that he is their chief strategist. Like, what? So a racist piece of shit that, you know, his appointment got praise from the KKK and Stormfront and shit, you know. That's his chief strategist. That's his general, basically. Who's he... And let me put it this way. This, this nice book, you know, I have over here that I actually just made a video recommending, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. You choose your general for your opponent, right? So if this is his strategist, who is his foe? Oh, right. Yeah. It's almost like his actions speak louder than his words. Oh, I had no idea these attacks were happening. So to those people, I, I look in the camera and say, stop it. Yeah. And also, you know, Hitler did that. Yeah. When he was first appointed, he called for an end to violence against the Jews and everything. He called for calm. He called for unity. He called for reaching out while his SS people were grabbing people off the streets. He called for unity and peace while killing. There's a great quote. Calls to unity are one of the most insidious methods of silencing dissent. And here's the thing. Unity can be good. Unity can be great. People who are minorities, people of color, people who are marginalized should have unity. We should unite. But there's a difference between uniting under a common cause and uniting with the people who are out to destroy you. That is not unity. That is suicide. If a group over there says, we've come to conquer you, just just lay down your arms and get along. We can all get, we can all be friends. We'll just take over. You don't have to fight or anything. We'll just be in charge. Just get along. No. No, what? No, 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 no. That's called conquest. That's bad. We don't want this. And so this is a form of conquest in a way, because if you look at how many people didn't vote, and how many people voted Hillary, how many people voted everywhere else, you run into the problem that really this is about a quarter of the nation that voted for Trump. And really, in a way, take take a slice of goodness from that, a little silver lining to that, that really it was only about a quarter of the nation. As depressing as that number is, at the same time, it's only a quarter whom actually voted for this Cheeto. But at the same time, isn't it also depressing that only a fourth of the people voted him in. Yes, because what, 49 point something percent of people didn't vote? And see, that right there is a big problem. I'm not going to sit there and do that whole thing of, fuck you if you didn't vote. I'm sort of unhappy with you if you did not vote, yes. But me yelling at you isn't going to do anything. I'll yell at Trump voters all day because you actively supported that piece of shit. You, you in some way, whether for economic policies, wealth, or honest bigotry supported a campaign of bigotry, ignorance, and hatred, and misrepresentation of whole groups of people for fear-mongering. The fact that you supported that, yeah, that's that. But for those who didn't vote, it's like, I can understand being disaffected, and I can understand, yes, Hillary sucked, and there was, of course, the whole DNC fuckery with Bernie Sanders, so I can understand the people who didn't vote out of sheer disgust. Or out of apathy. But you want to make a difference. You do actually have to vote. But it's weird. I used to not really believe it made a difference. But here's the thing. It's like if you want to shut down our corrupt justice system, everybody stop taking plea bargains. Everybody take their case to trial. Guess what? Justice system can't handle it. Literally. This has been statistically proven that if every case went to trial you would have a backlog that would be longer than a person's lifespan. And that would shut the system down. So what you have instead is the, you know, court to, you know, jail pipeline system where we want people to plea bargain and we want people to get in there as fast as we can. We don't want a trial. We don't want all that shit. You have the right to a fair and speedy trial, but we'll be damned if we want to give it to you. You have the right to a lawyer, but we'll be damned if we give you one that knows what they're doing. Or one who has the time to actually care about what they're doing with your case in particular. Right. They don't have to do that. They just have to give you a 
lawyer. But to take this back for a second, right? Jessica Jones and all that, huh? Wrap this all back around for a social issue, Bo. <laughs> Is that when you look at, like, Luke Cage, when you see the justice system and how it's portrayed in there, where I love how they did it in that show because you see the cops as these, you know, mostly sympathetic figures who are involved in something sort of beyond them. And you see some of them kind of go bad. You know, there's one cop who's completely corrupt and on the take, but he's also a likable character. For most of the show, you're like, hey, this guy's kind of a little bit of a dick. He's kind of nihilistic, but he strikes you as that kind of cop who's seen one too many things on the job and is kind of, you know, compassion fatigued out. Like, he, he's done too much, he's seen too much, and now, whatever, doesn't really give a shit anymore. But once you learn he's on the take, it's like, huh, wow, he actually works for the bad guy. I never, hmm, you know, because the rest of his character doesn't support that. But that was one of those great things about how they portray the cops. They're out there trying to do the right thing. They show, like, you know, the cops get out of hand in a couple scenes, right? Like, they, one of them attacks one of the people they're interrogating, trying to get to Luke Cage. But the way they've set it up at that point, they think Luke Cage is a cop killer. He's been framed, but they think he is a super-powered cop killer. So they're freaking out. <laughs> and so it becomes this sort of, like, conflict where, yeah, you have a central villain who's honestly a bad guy, right? But the rest of the people fighting all have a, a reason for what they're doing that's sympathetic and understandable. One that you can kind of relate to, even if it's wrong. Like, even um, the councilwoman. Cottonmouth's cousin? Yes. Miranda, I think. She is a bad person. Very bad. And you see her come into her full evilness as the show progresses. Where originally she starts as a politician. Where she's not an honest person. She's in some dirty dealings, right? She's not exactly good, but she's trying to use her cousin's bad connections and her own criminal upbringing to do good for Harlem. She's trying to bring about a new Harlem renaissance, even if it is tainted with drug money and blood money. She's trying to turn bad into good. In the end, though, it gets her. The bad outweighs the good enough that it, tw it twists her. You watch it happen as she, you know, takes that giant leap over that line between good and evil and doesn't look back. <laughs> Once she steps over that line, she keeps going. And you get to see her fall as being more from morally ambiguous, but sort of relatable to you just forsook the last part of your humanity, didn't you? Yep. Now you're just a fucking mad person. <laughs> that I think is an important social thing to sort of make more normalized in media is this there's this tendency to have that dichotomy between good and evil be stark to be wide to, this gulf to be massive good is shiny and virtuous and evil is mustache twirling villainy and you know never shall the two look alike when in reality it's never that simple Everybody's the hero of their own story. Everybody is the good guy of their own view of their actions. Nobody, well, almost no, nobody, is going to go out there and just say, I'm going to do villainy today. What was the character out of True Blood, I think? Oh, um, Russell Edgington. He was great because he was a bastard, and he loved being a bastard and had no compunctions about it. It's like, what? Why do you need to kill people? Because it makes me feel good. Because it makes my dick hard. Like, I do bad shit because I like doing bad shit and fuck everyone who gets in my way. I will do what I want because I am powerful. Rarely is that how things actually work. Right. I mean, he was a perfect exemplar, though, of the ultimate degradation of absolute power. He had lived for, like, over... 2,000 years, had powers beyond most other vampires. And so he had completely lost his connection to anything resembling humanity and had power almost unlimited and nothing really to do with it. So what did that turn into? Sick, twisted parody plays of disgusting depravity just to elicit a reaction. And see, let's talk about, actually, let's segue great into something here. 
that that addiction of acquisition it's a sort of sickness i think that afflicts a lot of what we call the the newborn wealthy people the go get it sort of a overachieving need to get more wealth trust fund type people the ones that are in the stock market cutthroat getting billions of dollars and just needing to get more regardless of the cost and consequence the slash and burn businessmen who will destroy a business to walk away with the final payment Mitt Romney yep. Donald Trump yep what that is though is it's not that they want the money see that's the thing most people think it's about the money and Yes, it's about the money, but not really. It's about what the money is to them. It's the acquisition of it, the gain. The numbers get bigger. It's about having more. It's not about having the amount they have. Whatever they have now is not enough. They get more, well, then they need more. They get more, then they still need more. They could have more money than, you know, there was one time I did a calculation where some, one of the wealthiest people would have to spend like more than a million dollars, like a minute for like a decade to go through their money. A million dollars, like a minute based on their income versus how much they had and everything. And it's like, you literally could not do that. Spend a million dollars a minute for a decade. What are you going to spend that on? How? What could you do with that? A lot of good, sure, but <laughs> yeah, but instead, you know, it's the hoarding. I think it, you know, I think it's the same thing basically as like a hoarding disorder, except with money. They just need to have more of it, more of it, need more. I, it's not about having the number be there. It's about having more of that number continuously. It's basic greed and addiction. Yes, it's addiction. It is literally addiction addiction to acquisition it is the thrill of the hunt i need to get more of it i need to keep getting more of it if i'm not getting it's it's a way to fill a void it's like any addiction it's a way to escape something and fill a void why do you think people get addicted to heroin now it's not just because it feels good lots of things feel good it's because it's mind-numbingly good you can forget everything it literally obliviates all of your worries concerns and troubles and offers you the bliss of mindlessness that is why a lot of people become addicted to a lot of things you can get a high off of pff, just about anything and you can become addicted to it. That acquisition, that high of crushing a big business deal where you just made your company another $10 million is one of those heady highs, especially thrilling. And yes, you can become addicted to that. Very much so, and quite easily. We've talked about this before, like when people try and blame the drugs or the addict for their addiction, when... It's life. <laughs> quite simply. Nobody starts with heroin saying, man, I'm looking forward to throwing away, you know, the rest of my life for the last five or so years that I actually do live in an increasingly decrepit and dying state. <laughs> no, that's not how that starts. No. People, that's not how it finishes either. No, because they never want that. That's never what they signed up for. That's not what they expected. Or It's people who end up in that way, the strung out addict you see on the street, it takes a special kind of hell to make somebody end up there it's not like someone's just like does a shot of heroin's like you know what this is worth throwing away the rest of my life for yep let me just go throw away my home now and get rid of my kids and everything because i found this that's not how that happens it's not how any addiction starts it starts with a coping mechanism it starts with some kind of need usually somebody you know you see somebody get hooked on coke i've seen it in the kitchen plenty of times it starts with that I work too many hours, not enough sleep, I need something, and caffeine's not cutting it anymore. I'm smoking too many cigarettes, it's not cutting it anymore. I need a little something extra to keep me going. I just can't sustain these kind of hours. Oh, now I can. And all of a sudden, they're working hard, doing everything, but now, every so often, they need a little bump, right? They need a little more, just to keep going. And then all of a sudden, or very slowly, but all of a sudden... It seems every yeah. time because yeah. it creeps up on you. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you find yourself sitting there doing questionable things just to get your next dose because it's no longer the edge. It's the functionality itself now. It's no longer the edge to your game. It is your game now. This is what you do to function now. And you didn't mean for it to happen. It's not what you wanted. It was supposed to be that bump, that extra push. But now... 
it's the only push you have. You've become addicted <laughs> to now, it. Imagine being that way from birth with wealth acquisition. Because that's the key. It's an upbringing thing as much as anything else. Because when you grow up in an environment, right, where you have incredibly wealthy, rich family that gets what they want, that becomes normal. That becomes the standard. Gaining things, acquiring things is how things are done. It's just what happens. This is how you function. Like, when you have parents, especially the wealthy, like, jet setter type, you know, financial people, I've read different articles by the children of these people that were fucked up by it because they were basically raised on this mindset that acquisition was achievement. To acquire things was to win, and winning is living. You lose, you fail, you die. Because that's the kind of harsh life that a lot of the sort of people in the financial trading industry live, where there are a lot of them are on the knife's edge of one wrong deal being in the fucking hole. And so that affects people. And when you grow up that way, you come out of it learning that visible achievement with numeric value is power and status. You learn that having a bigger number means you are more important more powerful. You are more valid because your number is bigger. It's one of the most basic instinctive things. Why do you think scores motivate people? You want a bigger number than another person. It's one of the most fundamental fucking things in our primitive eight brains here that we want our numbers to be bigger than their numbers. Doesn't matter if it's food, women, babies, weapons, points. Our numbers need to be bigger than their numbers. Damn it. That's how we feel about this. Just it's in our brain. It's wired that way. And so let's segue to something here. The election. What motivated a lot of the more, you know, Republican voting base that were very much on that Trump bandwagon? We need to overcome these liberals, right? We need to be bigger than them. Our numbers need to be bigger. We need to be more powerful. And it's the same dick-waving measuring bullshit that's built into our psychology, that's built into our society even. It's where the whole acquisition cult sort of thing comes from, is this idea that we, as a people need to demonstrate our value repeatedly and often through visibly demonstrable means. It's part of the culture that glorifies wearing, you know, gold chains and everything because it's a visible sign of your money, which means it's a visible sign of your power. You can sit there and wear 50 gold chains made of solid gold. Well, then you're a wealthy motherfucker who also is confident enough to wear them without fear. It's a status thing and everybody does it just a different ways through different cultures. Look at Trump with his solid gold fucking signs. Or lower numbers in case of time and speed. Yes. <laughs> but it's always about that competition. Look at Trump with his solid gold fucking shit. His own private plane. His own, like, decked out everything. His own attempts to be the best, the most. He'll make your head spin. Right? Like, it'll be the best ever. It'll be the mostest. It'll be biggerest. Like, whatever bigger -er words he wants to use at the time, you know? Bigly. <laughs> it'll be bigly greatly. It will be tremendous. <laughs> it might even be in beginning. But basically, what I'm going to come down to here for the core of this, to move past the manifestations of it, is our reverence for competition in total. That That's the root of all of this, is our society's need to make things a competition and define people as winners and losers. That's sort of a core need our society has, I think, as part of our original survivalistic upbringing, that competition makes one more viable for mating. It makes one more survivable. If you're better than your peers at something, you should pass on your genetic traits more. That's sort of the whole evolutionary Darwinian thing. But really, haven't we? We've moved past that as a society. We've achieved a level of independence from the cycle of nature. In, in its infancy, as we as it is, we have broken free of the cycle of that basic need of survival, reproduce, die. We've broken past it. We're looking to the stars, making art and shit, right? We've gone past the basic fucking, you know, live, rut, die, repeat cycle of existence as it was. And so we, I think, also should have moved beyond this need for competition. This drive to be better than other people. 
it is not always a bad thing to wish to be better, to wish to compete against yourself, right? To become better than who you were. Or that competitive sense of, I'm going to use another person who is superior to me as someone to compete against to improve myself. Like this track runner here who is better than me. I will use his scores to compete against it, to try to improve myself and become more like that. But no, it's unhealthy in the way we do it in this country. Our competition is cutthroat and total, where losers are destroyed and winners are held up as gods until such a moment as they fail and then are destroyed. It's, it's sort of sadistic and sort of disgusting. This sort of very vindictive and bipolar cult we have for our victors, where they are only enshrined so long as they maintain their victorious nature. A hint of a scandal, anything like that, well then they are cast down from their pedestal. Because... No one's just a human. No. And I'm not saying that, oh, we should ignore, you know, oh, a, a sports guy beat his wife. Oh, we should just ignore that because he's a sports guy. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we automatically hold our victors to be more important than they should be. We're holding up sports people as someone to emulate in every aspect of your life. These are people we're saying should be heroes to our kids because they can run a fucking ball fast. That's stupid as shit. Running a ball fast is not a good qualifier for someone's life hero, like someone they should be emulating in the totality of their, you know, young existence. Someone who could throw a ball. No, we should be aiming a little fucking higher than that. Someone should be like, you know, someone's hero should be like Einstein or something, right? Someone who has achieved great and lasting things, impactful and noble in the world in some way, right? Your hero, the person that you're trying to emulate should be someone who has had a lasting and important impact on everybody around them, something great and meaningful so that you can shoot for something great and meaningful yourself. We can relate right into Trump from this, competition. Trump is a product of that. Oh, yes. A comment here. When I lived in the U.S., I was astonished by how obsessed people were are with sports, competition, and stats. Oh, yeah, it's all about the numbers. That's the thing. You know, it's all about the money, Lebowski. Not really. It's all about the numbers, Lebowski. Like, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. We want to have the biggest numbers. The best numbers so big they'll make your head spin. Like, <laughs> we want to be the best. Like, no one ever was. <laughs> I couldn't help it, <laughs> but we just want to be the best at everything ever, period. We have to be the most, the biggest, the bestest, the shiniest, the fastest, the strongest, everything. And we gotta catch them all. And we have to do it now. Can't be later. We have to do it right now. We have to be the best at it. And we have to do it now, instantly, and it has to be the shiniest, the best, the fastest, the prettiest, the most expensive. Like, we are gluttonous as a society and I don't mean that in the traditional sense I mean oh we are gluttonous in what we desire we are gluttonous in what we expect from the world a lot of us sit there and wait entitled entitled yes so many and it's not like ah, oh, you damn Millennials no I mean all of us people the human race is so very entitled in so many ways where for the longest time, we had a whole group of people who believed the entire universe existed, and they still do, by the way, I believe this, existed purely so that we could be here. How fucking more entitled can you get as a species for conceit? That the entirety of existence and all of its billions of years of existence and the cosmos themselves were spawned so that on some speck of rock out there, some squishy people could crawl out of some mud. Like, <laughs> there is the conceit there but we take so much for granted and we take <laughs> look at america right now right look at the people who voted for trump look at how much of the world they they want their white christian america back that they take for granted used to exist when in reality it was never a thing this dreamland that they opine for was never real it was a fiction a fiction sold to them by some snake oil salesman looking to get some power looking to make some money and so they saw them like the 1950s Be Leave It to Beaver style world that was a fiction. <laughs> they sold that to the people. And B 
be damned how many people bought it up and opined for the time for a great white America that used to be, you know. It's like, for everybody who views this now or later, if you're not already familiar with what has already happened in the wake of Trump's election, how many incidents of people being told or, you know, told racist things, sexist things, how many people have been directly threatened, attacked, beaten, intimidated, fired, cast out, how many trans it? people have committed suicide out or of been fear murdered? Fear. By the way, biggest year for trans murder. People in the U.S. are obsessed with materialism and entertainment, but mostly materialism. But it's a, it's, there's a void in our culture, I think, that we're not fulfilled by the way we live. Our culture doesn't actually fulfill us because it has given us a meaning. We're told to work for stuff, and we're told to do that until we can reach some mythical period of retirement where we can just do stuff, I guess, and sit there and die, and yeah. We're told to find meaning in consumerism, but yes. we know that consumerism increases antisocial behavior and unhappiness and so on. Well, it's finding meaning in objects, which is stupid. It's trying to find a spiritualism, if you will. Something fulfilling of the mind, right? In something like owning something is going to suddenly change your whole perspective in the universe and bring you greater understanding and wisdom or something. No, no, buying a new couch is not going to fill that hole in your soul, that need you have for something. Because if you ask me, we have a strong disconnect amongst our people from each other. We talk about touch starvation, we talk about, you know, social deprivation where people, despite the internet, feel more alone and more isolated than they ever have. Because we feel disconnected from each other in a way profound. Like, we feel, generally speaking, by many different, you know, studies done, we feel profoundly disconnected and alienated from one another. That we don't understand each other. That we don't sympathize with each other. We don't even get other people on a basic level of their existence in many cases. The othering in this country that is so pervasive, pernicious, and yet unspoken is amazing to see if you actually look for it, where you can just see the complete erasure in the media of diversity, where you have certain types of people that are allowed to be represented. Like, look at, here's a good example for you, right? Legend of Korra, right? Do you know that anybody not familiar with the show, uh, the most of the show is irrelevant for this point, but the two, main, two of the main characters, who are both women, end up falling in love at the end, basically. They have a final closing scene where they're holding hands in a reminiscent pose to a marriage thing, as sort of a, hey, look, they're, we're showing you basically they're going to be a couple. They had to fight to even get that in there first, this idea of a same-sex relationship at all. Which, to begin with, they had to fight to get the show to happen at all because people were convinced that boys wouldn't watch a show about a girl. Quote. But they got their show. Then they had to fight to get that ending scene. They had actually talked about it, by the way, for anybody who says, oh, well, they just added that in for SJW bullshit. They had been talking about that since season two, actually, and had been foreshadowing it since season three. In fact, the creator himself said, if you did not see this coming and you watched the last two seasons of this show, you were watching only for heterosexual relationships to develop. Because he foreshadowed the shit out of it. You could see it. But my point with bringing that up is that it's considered subversive and groundbreaking for two female characters to hold fucking hands and be romantic. Not even, they couldn't even get their kiss they wanted in there. They just had to hold, have them in a pose reminiscent of a marriage ceremony pose and have them look into each other's eyes. And it's like, that's normal. People do that. Just, just that happens. People fall in love and sometimes they happen to be women. Fuck you. But that is endemic to the fact that our media is part of what polices our acceptable culture. It polices what we view as normal, where you have, let's say, 90 sitcom formula. You have the standard nuclear family with this kind of person, these kind of people, or their kind of neighbors, and this formula gets repeated. That gets seen as what's normal. And when you have, like, these same things, you know, oh, 
there's a gay person coming in. And then suddenly this is a big plot arc because, oh, the neighbor's gay. It alienates and further reinforces the idea that this is abnormal, that this is something that should be made a big deal about and we should be concerned about. Rather than just saying, oh, hey, did you know the neighbor's gay? No. Okay. And that, you know, the end of that. That would normalize this, right? That would treat that as like, oh, this is just a thing that some people are. Some people happen to be gay. Hey, you know. Giving it significance, even if positively, uh, really does uh, sometimes, especially in the popular media. You yeah. Know? Now, that's the thing that uh, some people don't understand, especially white people, when it comes to, say, Luke Cage. Again, is... Oh, so it's the whole, you know, you can have your B-E-T, but we can't have W-E-T type shit. No, it's the fact that everything else is W-E-T. That's what they're missing. Exactly. That's the thing that they miss is perspective when they watch a show like that. When it's just, oh, for once there's a show in which black people actually are treated like full human beings. That's groundbreaking. The fact that that's novel is its own statement. Yeah. And yet somehow they miss it. Well, we know how they miss it. Because they want to, for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them are genuinely ignorant and don't understand. But that's the problem, is that fuzzy line between genuine ignorance and privilege and being Well, privilege is part of it. what creates that genuine ignorance. Because if you're raised as like a white suburban kid in white suburban America, not really knowing any black people, raised in a more affluent neighborhood... These things don't really seem real to you. Hello, when you Trump? See, when you see a ghetto, that looks like, no, that, where is that, in Africa? What? No. Because your perspective is framed by what you experience. And so when you grow up affluent and wealthy and white and privileged, when you see, or, you know, let's say you hear a story about some black person just getting shot for no reason. You're like, no, that couldn't litter. No, he had to have done something. That's not the world we live in. What fucking nonsense is that? Thursday, we just elected a president that suffers from affluenza. Yeah. Isn't that terrifying? Yes, because that's sociopathy. It's being so wealthy, one cannot understand the concerns of those beneath you. It's literally alien to them. The idea of having, you know, it's like, I, I guarantee to you, Trump has no familiarity with having to think about how will I buy my next meal. He doesn't know what that feels like. He doesn't know what that looks like. How, how could you expect him to have empathy for those people if he's never even had to see it in his life or experience it or even come 10 feet near it? He has people for that. Did you hear about his altruistic gesture? He's going to refuse his salary as president. <laughs> oh, yeah, because 400 k a year is a big deal to you, you piece of shit. What other tabs did we Oh, have? yeah. That list here, we have about Trump ticking all 14 boxes in Umberto Eco's list of what makes a fascist a fascist, right? All of them. You know, the cult of tradition. Need I say more? Right? The, the, the make America make it, make America great again. The traditionalism in this country. Everybody's saying, I want to, I, I see my America as under yep. threat and I want to get my America, America back. That's not white supremacy. The rejection of modernism, which ties right into what we were just talking about. My America back, which includes, you know, white people everywhere and not under this newfangled technology and. Everybody knew their place. Mm -hmm. And the cult of action for action's sake. God damn if Trump's, Trump is not a fucking man of action just to act. Just doing things. A whirly gig. I love that word. A whirly gig of pointless action. Just doing things because he's there. Disagreement is treason. Hello, Hillary. <sighs> Hello, like, all of his supporters just about. Like, that's what including, I mean, is that that's what they said about her. They believe that, oh, well, you know, she needs to be investigated and... Then, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, the fear of difference. The, the need you Do say I, more again? Yeah. Appeal to a frustrated middle class. Again. Obs the obsession with a plot. Possibly an international one. Ooh. 
Ooh. Well, just take your pick at this point. Yeah. Which like, conspiracy theorist he's, you know, signed on. Uh-huh. The followers must feel humiliated by the ostentatious wealth and force of their enemies. The Jews. Yes. Steve Bannon. Uh-huh. Life is permanent welfare. Warfare. Warfare. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. I, I, haven't we seen this for a while, though, actually? Well, Always when, be afraid. When, the Muslims are coming. Mm-hmm. When you say life is permanent warfare, what I think of is what you said uh, at the beginning of your review of The Art of War. All war is deception? Yes. Well, how yeah. did the alt-right win the election? Let's not tell anybody. Deception. Let's not tell anybody who we really support. It's warfare, yes. Life is warfare. Mm-hmm. Popular elitism. <laughs> yeah. Everybody is educated to become a hero, declaring that I alone can fix it, presenting himself as the one true savior. Yeah. Machoism. <laughs> Machismo. Yes. Uh, do I even need to say anything? Grab the pussy. Yeah. Against rotten par parliamentary governments. Even though I'm the one who admitted to corrupting them in the first place. Irony, come on down. Ah, yes, the new speak. Yeah? His followers have it in, ty in, in spades. Oh, what, what was it that they were actually calling them spades and things like that? Uh -huh. Using different words for talking about different racial and yep. minorities. And... So that they wouldn't be called out on it. Oops. Yep. So yeah, those are the 14 points. And he hits them all quite easily to the point where about half of them I just laughed as the argument for them because... It's a single sentence of what he did. truth. So, another article here which talks about the rise of Trump as mirroring the rise of Hitler... Yeah, yeah, we were looking at this one earlier. The yes, one. but I'm going to go over the numbers now. Okay. Just for to hammer home the earlier point I just made with uh -huh. the other list. Uh -huh. He blames a specific group of immigrants for all problems and promises to eliminate them from our society. Sound familiar? Build a wall, deportation, you know. Deportation. Deportation, registration, bans on immigration. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Sounds kind of like that exactly again the restrictions on muslims and, yep yeah he'll sell his hate his hope for the poorest citizens in this country right yeah yeah because what he's doing is using hate to draw upon anger he's turning anger into hate basically people are angry at their situation and he's giving them somebody to be angry at which forges anger into hate. Because now that you have somebody to be angry at, you can hate them. You just need a scapegoat. Yep. And so, you know, people might think, you know, concentration camps won't happen, you know, but we can certainly throw all the undesirables in prison, can't we? As we have been since the 70s, by the way, throwing in a mass incarceration in a, you know, statistically aberrant level of favoritism towards minorities in the sense of we imprison them at a rate that is tremendously higher than, you know, white people who constitute the majority of the population. Um, and of course, you know, you're going to hear that racist bullshit argument. Well, it's because they're actually the criminals. We're not. And it's like, but statistically speaking, this does not bear out by any statistical analysis like every dawn of crime that literally doesn't bear out at all. So if you want to bring that one up, you're lying. Just, just to note that. That point, though, about, you know, they make the point here, not taking him seriously makes him more dangerous. That's really important to note is the amount of people who are not protesting and not getting worried because they dismiss his ability to do things. Oh, he's just Trump. What can he do, you know? He's just one man, and he doesn't know all that much, so how much damage can he really do to a system he doesn't understand? Well, you know, what's funny is that that's actually, if you read a lot of the early 1920s German literature about Hitler and stuff, is how they sort of treated him, a, a blowhard. 
this guy, yeah, you know, he might get elected. He talks a lot of shit, you know. He's going to be a big blowhard up there, but, you know. What, what, what harm can he really do, you know? He talks big. Well, we saw where that went. That escalated quickly. There's the point they love to make here that, you know, in the 19... I'll, I'll read it for you, just... So, you know, in a 1990 interview with Vanity Fair, Ivana Trump mentioned that, at least at one point, her husband used to keep a book filled with Hitler's speeches by his bedside. By the way, it's called My New Order, sequel to Mein Kampf, written by Hitler. You know, but you could say, just the crazy ramblings of a scorned wife, yeah? Well, no, because Trump actually confirmed it. But he also went on to say that he thought the guy who gave him the book was a Jew, which was later confirmed that he was not. <laughs> so... It's, it's one thing to own a copy of that book, right? You know, like, I own a copy of Mein Kampf as a point of historical reference. It's important to understand these things, to know how these things happen, and to read the mindset that makes these things happen. I do not sleep with it by my bedside, though, because that's fucking creepy and weird. Because it's Mein Kampf. It's a book about my will, Hitler's will, enforcing his will on people. It's a bad book about manipulating people. And his sequel book was about his speeches, oh, the way he manipulated people with loud, boisterous rhetoric and anger-inducing claims. And he was the one who also said people will believe are much more likely to believe a large lie than a small one. And what is, what's Trump done? Big lies everywhere. And what's happened? They get believed by his people, regardless of how demonstrably false they are. They still get proven in their eyes as right, simply because it sounds right. When we look at, you know, we have, of course, Pence. We have Steve Bannon. We have the talk of Muslim registration. We have the talk of banning Muslims. We have the different talks of Mexico's wall building and the stopping of all immigration, basically. We have the talk of Japanese internment camps as precedent. Protect America first. Doesn't that sound like protect white America first? Yes. Yes, it does, because that's what it means. Maybe we should bring this to a close soon. But I'm going to bring out a very just blunt as fuck point here. When Trump said, make America great again, people knew what that meant. At least a lot of us on both sides. Make America white again is what he meant. All this, you know, taco truck on every corner talk. What is it? I mean, the man's a racist who barely can contain it. Barely can hold that in. Racist housing practices. And oh, so yeah. On exploitation of poor illegal immigrants. Oh, by the way, he employed poor illegal immigrants and exploited the shit out of them and refused to pay a lot of people and has contributed negatively to the economy for basically his entire life. Is a terrible businessman, lost $916 million in one year and used that for justification and never paid taxes again. And this is the person we have in office who talked about grabbing women by the pussy. And if you tell me that's locker room talk, I will tell you that's sexual assault. Just to clarify that, in case you were confused, if you just walk up to a woman and grab her by the pussy, you're a piece of shit, a sexual assaulter. You're somebody who should be going to jail. And the fact that uh, we have somebody who self-admitted to doing things like this and enjoying the privilege, literally enjoying the privilege of being powerful as a shield against repercussions. If you're rich, you can just walk up to them and kiss them. And they, they'll just let you do it. They'll let you do anything. Quote. That's literally talking about not only committing sexual assault, but using wealth and privilege as a shield from the consequences and enjoying it. Well, that is the textbook definition, I think, of a piece of shit person. Like, just a bad fucking person. <laughs> On the all. Like, how do you justify that? How do you justify any of what he... Mike Pence, how do you justify him? Electroshock therapy is something he said he's okay with for gay people, you know, to cure them. You, you justify it because you want to make America white again. You want to make America straight again. Make America white, straight, and goddamn male again, is what that means. When black people and women and other people knew their place. It's like, you know, the woman who talked about... Black woman who talked about how she was told she should sit in the back of the bus now. Restore the social order. Yeah. You know, the social order that means white is right. 
By the way, for all those people, though, who think they're on the right side of this and you're going to be riding that wave to the power and top, I would love to remind you that at one point the Irish were hated as scum and you can't get fucking whiter than that, can you? It, this is not about really white. It's about class. It's about privilege and power and who is on top. And if you're not on top, you're just various steps away from being the next victim. That's how this works. This is a zero-sum game. It's a cannibal game where either you win the game or you are on the list of people to be devoured by the winners. That is the ultimate end of this competition cult I discussed earlier. That's the ultimate end of this old dick-waving point of competition, is that this is a shark culture where you either win or wait to be devoured by the winners. And that whole point about resistance, I said at the very beginning, that's why we have to do it. Because, don't know about you, but of me, I'm not happy about that kind of world, where we have to live in a world of competition, a world of hate, a world where we are... Actually, <laughs> that's a good question, though. What? Can you guys explain to me how he got so many white women votes? There are articles uh, discussing that. Yes. I haven't read any of them personally. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for it, but a fair amount of it, from what I understand, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've read so far, a fair amount of it comes from that sort of not it won't happen to me effect. That's why I was thinking. It's um, first off, groups tend to be racially hegemonic, so when you're white, you tend to be around other white people. And even women tend to uh, avoid the idea of being victims, and so they don't like to view themselves that way, and don't see themselves as minoritized, and so they don't, at least white cis women especially, relate with trans women of color, for example. Right. And they don't relate with just how oppressed they are. It's the very beginning of Everyday Sexism with Laura Bates, where she talks about how it's those little pinpricks you go through every day that are normalized, and so you don't see them. Yeah. And so in turn, it's a lot, because of their relative privilege inside of the society, it's easier to vote for Trump. Yeah. When you don't have as much appreciation for the significance of the distinction between he and Hillary. Yeah. And the media played into that a lot to normalize his ideas and not contrast the two starkly enough. In those, especially in those kinds of contexts, because well, again, it's the popular media, and these are radical ideas. Basically, intersectionality itself is something that isn't mainstream. And also, fear is a powerful motivator, <laughs> and you can ignore certain things if you're made to be afraid of something you perceive as larger. So you know, a fair amount of these votes were contributed to by fear, by fear of the. Muslims, by fear of immigration, by fear of this, that, and the other. Name, take, pick your point. Fear of gay people, fear of trans people, fear of whatever. And so, yeah, okay, Trump is a kind of an asshole towards women and stuff. And, you know, they might think it's a little bit overblown. You know, obviously the Hillary people are really making a big deal of this. You know, oh, he said it a long time ago. And, you know, this, that, and the other. And it's easy to sort of brush it away when you have this other issue in your head more dominating your thoughts well you see i think that trump seems more genuine as a person seems like he wants to really get things done and he Hillary says what he's he really corrupt and so i mean i just got into looking at this stuff like three days ago and the election is tomorrow and from what i've seen i mean trump seems like a good guy and it's like it's not even that trump seems like a good guy by comparison. By comparison. It's that Trump seems like, you know, I think I could see Trump being a better choice for, you know, Yeah, and again, America. that's what it is, depending on what your pet issue is. See, that's the key right there. For, you know, the feminists, that was a huge breaking point. Huge! That was like an amazingly powerful moment for them to say, what the literal fuck? But well, for pretty the, much his entire campaign. Sure, was but that, that was like a breaking point right there for people going, are you shitting me? Really? This, what? He just said that. People, people, he just said that right there. Yet, it was easy for those people to dismiss it because that wasn't what they were concerned with. They, the non-feminists especially, right? The more, how to say this without being completely insulting, but more complacent. 
women. The ones that, you know, are more privileged, who haven't experienced as much sexism, who haven't experienced that kind of workplace harassment and such, who maybe, you know, they know what happens, but think it's overplayed a bit, and, you know, think that, you know, uh, well, I bet, you know, that woman... You know, some women are raped, of course, but I bet she's making the claim to get money. Newsflash, <coughs> not all women are socially <coughs> conscious. Yeah. And that not, you know, not all everybody. I know bigoted gay people, literally. I know a couple of people who are, they're very gay, very socially aware on that issue. Hate black people. Mm -hmm. Are completely racist pieces of shit. Very socially aware on gay issues and stuff. Support trans people. Think black people are the scum of the earth. It take, like, just because you're socially aware in one respect does not mean you are in all, or in any other. You could have these women voting for Trump because they think Trump is going to help support small business. They think Trump's going to be good for the small businessmen and the American economy, and he's going to support the little guy. Maybe it's because they don't care about these things. They think that they're overblown, and they agree with more traditional values about gender roles in society. There's also that, internalized misogyny. Where Trump is a hearkener to the standard gender roles. A man in charge. Powerful man in lead with a big, powerful voice and taking charge of stuff and doing things. And Trump can grab my pussy. I've heard that. Well, but the funny part about that, right, is then it's consent. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like it's that meaningful distinction. Yeah. Yeah. You're consenting to it, meaning if he grabbed your pussy then, you consented to him grabbing your pussy, meaning it's a consensual sex act. But he was not talking about that. No, he was not. He was talking about grabbing a person's pussy who is unwilling. And how he can get away yeah, with it. Yeah, completely different, actually. Anything else you have to think of? Um, well, as far as wrapping things up, there's just, uh... Going to your channel, because this is your show, which is uh, Captain Obvious. It's uh, youtube.com slash Bobo Thursday, all one word. Links below. Um, we still need to get you a Patreon account set up, yes. so we're going to do that at some point. And, uh, yeah, this is going to be a new weekly thing at this point. Not a problem. So, you thanked us for explaining. Uh -huh. I mean, of course, that's... Just what I understand me, in my opinion. That's just your opinion, man. That's just like my opinion, man. Word. But, no, um, I think, based on what I've read and everything, that that at least gets a part of it. I'm sure, I'm certain, in fact, there's many more factors, more individual points that factor into various individuals, women's choices to vote for whom they did. Because, of course, no one person is uh, simple, much less a large group of right. people, so it's necessarily generalizing, but based on its tendencies based on reality. I think, to close, right? Uh -huh. A lesson we should all take from this, like on the liberal side of things, you know, the blue side of that fence, is that education about consequences, I think, is a big point to be made, especially for groups that are voting against their own interests, like women voting for Trump. I think, I think if you could, you know, as a good step would be to bring out the statistics about sexual assault, about violence, and how much of it is unreported, about how much of it is demonized, how many people who try to report sexual assaults that are provable even are basically turned away, their rape kits aren't tested, they're encouraged by even the police to not testify because, oh, the, you know, it's a lot of time, you'll be re-traumatized, you might not even be believed, and it, it's a lot of work, and... Jessica Jones. Oh, yeah, let's let's tie that in again one more time and make this bow perfect, right? Because Jessica Jones, part of that show, talks about her PTSD dealing with her repeated rape by a mind-control maniac who basically told her to want it, which, by the way, is not consent, and for anybody who's confused, making somebody comply does not count as consent. We have a word for it. It's called under duress. It's called coercion. Yeah. You know, it's like you can't sign a contract under duress. Someone points a gun to your head and says, sign over your possessions. A contract is not valid because it's signed under duress. It's a legal precedent, even. Consent cannot be given under duress, by the way, as a point. But the struggle she has 
convincing people about Kilgrave and his existence and what he can do and what he did to her is sort of a great allegory for any particular woman's struggle to convince people of what happened to her if she was raped or violated in some way. Convincing people that it was real, that it happened, that this can happen is often the biggest struggle, more than the court case or anything else. It's just convincing people to take them seriously, that yes, I was attacked, I was hurt, I was violated and wronged by somebody else, and they need to be punished. You'd be shocked, maybe, by how many people go, I don't know, all of a sudden. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that this just happened to the entire police precinct, and at the end of it, they're laughing about it like it's a big joke. Because he told them to. Oh, uh, right. Resistance to persecution and discrimination. Education for people that are ignorant of the effects of what they're doing. And awareness of other people's struggle. That, I think, is the beginning of surviving the Trump regime. Look for other people being targeted and stand up for them, because goddammit, one day you might be targeted and you'll need them, too. And if they're already gone, just like the old saying said, right? There was no one left to speak for me. So, speak up. Speak up and speak up now and speak up before it is fucking too late. I think we are done with the first show. Like I said, Toodaloo. links are all below and stuff. So, uh, that was our first show and hopefully we'll get more professional going forward.